Hi, I'm Arthur Haynes, and I thought I'd bring you along on a weekend excursion to one of the rugged islands off the coast of Maine. And this weekend is as much about being outside in the open as it is gathering some of our own food, both plant and animal. On our way here, we were graced by several bald eagles, and now we're listening to the herring gulls and the greater blackback gulls chorusing. Enjoy your time. Now I've made my way out to some of the cliffs that are here along the edge of this particular island and I'm searching for something very important. Folks that have paid attention to my videos have seen me speaking about adaptogens where I discussed uh, many of their benefits with this plant called dwarf ginseng. This particular species that is found up here at the very edge top of the cliff is a plant that goes by the name of rose root or rhodiola rosea is its scientific name and this is another species that as an adaptogen helps us with many things coping with stress recovering faster from athletic activity even potentiating the effects of other medicine to help people combat various illnesses including cancer there are very few places in the northeast the northeastern United States where rose root is actually abundant enough to collect because with this particular species we gather the rise on the underground portion so it can be lethal collection for the plants but here on this particular island there are many 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 mats of this plant along the turf at the tops of the cliffs and so long as we're very conscientious in our collecting we're able to enjoy this plant's medicine and have it deal with uh, all of the stress that we have to accommodate in our daily lives. Give you folks a little closer view of the rose root. It actually occurs all along this cliff face. So you can see the habitat that it occurs in here in the northeast. This part of the world is called Wabanaki, the Dawn Land. And the people that lived here were the Wabanakayu, the people of the Don Land. This region receives its name by its eastern location. In other words, the sun's rays touch here in the morning ahead of most of North America. These coastal islands were an important source of food at one time for the Native Americans. The seabirds that nest here, because there are no predators, would create great colonies, but the natives could access these with their watercraft to collect eggs in the spring and early summer. Now, of course, they're still used today. Some of these islands are used by the local people for raising sheep because they don't need to erect fences. And the sheep actually eat the grasses and forbs on the interior of the island during the summer. And then during the winter season, you can see this large band of algae or seaweed, and this becomes one of their important foods during that time. So it makes this extremely nutrient-dense food. Spending the weekend on a coastal island in Maine, of course the food theme would be ocean foods. And the seaweeds are some of the nutrient-dense plant foods that we can still acquire even this time of year, though they are certainly out of their prime collection where their leaves are extremely tender. You can see the brown alga here, Fucus, which is called bladderwrack, and just underwater are the green leaves of ulva, a species of sea lettuce. And this particular species is still fairly tender and can be very carefully torn from its holdfast so that we can gather this food for tonight's feast. And there are a lot of plant foods for the foragers here. Stinging nettle, once the leaves and shoots are denuded of their spines, there are stitchworts for salad greens, even stinging nettle for tea, and early part of the season for their shoots. 
And when we move closer to the coast, we find saltwater adapted species like orac and scotch lovage that we can use their foliage for both salad greens and pot herbs. The lovage is a relative of the osher root found in the west. So part of tonight's supper is coming from this cobble and gravel flat. We're using these tined tools that resemble short rakes to excavate and unearth these animals here, the soft shell clam. And these clams are usually called steamer clams by the locals because that's their normal way of preparing them. And in fact, the indigenous in this area called them essig. Very, very delicious and are usually served with butter or just eaten after being steamed for a short time. You can see over here, the rest of our group is at work. And there's our catch for the day. So the traditional way the soft shell clams are cooked now that we have metal, it's over an open fire in these pots. And you can see them mixed in there with some periwinkles that we've also collected from the tide pools. And once the clams have opened up completely and the steam has covered them for a while, we'll be eating them. Each landscape has its own power to offer people and provides its own lessons. The only way for us to experience them is to actually be there, to experience the weather, geology, and even to derive nourishment from that landscape. And that is how we can have the strength and vitality of the indigenous people everywhere, because they were there experiencing that landscape firsthand. Fresh caught mackerel from one of the tributaries to the ocean. One of the final activities of the weekend is to gather sweet grass. And to find this particular grass, we need to move into specific salt marshes where it grows. Sweet grass was used by the Native Americans who lived in this area in their ceremonies as a smudge, and it was used in purification and cleansing. And we're here to gather it for our own ceremonial use. Sweet grass was called Zwickalazl by the natives that lived in this area. And we have to learn how to select its blades of grass from all of these that you see so that we can put together our own sweet grass bundles.